victory, French strategy and operations in the Great War. General Doty has developed several generations of Army historians, both military and civilian, and started me on the path that led to my sitting here today by hiring me onto the faculty at West Point to teach military history back in 1997 when dinosaurs were in the earth. And a lot of General Doty's intellectual offspring are sprinkled around this room. So it's a thrill for us to have him here today. Dr. Thomas Bogart is a staff historian with us at the U.S. Army Center of Military History, where he's a specialist in the Cold War. Dr. Bogart is also an expert in the diplomatic and intelligence history of the World War I era, and is the author of The Zimmerman Telegram, Intelligence, Diplomacy, and America's Entry into World War I. He recently served as chief historian for the International Spy Museum here in Washington, D.C., and earned his PhD from St. Anthony's College, Oxford, in 2002. Thomas is currently writing a history of U.S. Army intelligence activities in Europe during the early Cold War. And then last but certainly not least, Dr. Jennifer Keene is professor and chair of the Department of History at Chapman University in Southern California. And she's a specialist in the American military experience during World War I. She's currently also president of the Society for Military History. Uh, Jennifer's published three books on America and the Great War to date, including one of my personal favorites, Bill Boys, The Great War and the Remaking of America. And she's, I believe she's currently working on a, more, large, a larger synthesis of the American experience in the Great War. So uh, what a great panel we've got today uh, to dig into a really interesting topic, America's entry into the Great War. And with that, I'll turn it over to General Dunn. Let me begin by saying I am uh, assistant uh, president. I'll be, begin by saying it's a pleasure to be here uh, uh, today. Uh, I was asked to speak uh, primarily about the condition of the French Army uh, when the Americans arrived uh, in April 19, 1917. And I always find that when you uh, look at the condition of the French in uh, 1917, it's interesting to look at their experience up to that point. This is the chart that the French did a number of years ago to show their casualties in World War I by year. Uh, and by, uh, by month. You start off on the left, it's August 1914, uh, then January 1915, January uh, 1916, 17, and then 18. And then you can see the level of those losses each uh, year. Those are staggering losses. They will take 380,000 killed in the first two months of the, uh, of the war. Uh, but this is more than a casualty list. This is a, uh, a, a learning line or a learning table showing you how the French changed their methods, <clears throat> changed their technology, and tried to fight this war differently. At the beginning of the war, they were doing frontal assaults with infantry with virtually no uh, heavy artillery. They had 5,000 uh, light artillery uh, for their army, about 500 heavy artillery, and most of their attacks had a little bit of artillery support, but none at all. They begin to change that in 1915. You can see the spring offensives. They take terrible casualties at that time, but lower casualties than in 1914. They're madly manufacturing heavy artillery, so when they launched their massive, massive uh, autumn offensive uh, in 1915 in Champagne, uh, once again, they will take uh, uh, huge casualties, but fewer casualties on the whole than what they had taken thus far. Then you go forward into 1916, and if you look at those losses, most people think the French absorbed most of the losses in 1916, and 1916 overshadows everything else. It doesn't. It really doesn't. Here, you can see those losses that began in February 1916. Uh, they come across. There's a peak in July 1916. Why is there a peak? It's the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. Uh, the French attack alongside the British on the Somme. They are, in fact, the only ones who are successful on the first day of the uh, Somme. Uh, but they do take terrible casualties to that. Not in that, but nonetheless, the casualties uh, they take are still uh, in line with what they have taken thus far. Uh, the casualties in the remaining part of 1916 are interesting in the sense that General Robert D. Bell replaces Pétain as the commander of uh, French forces. He will put together two counteroffensives, one in October, that succeeds. Notice there's, not even, there's barely a blip in October. They drive the Germans back about 10 kilometers. They celebrate it as a great victory. Then in December, they attack again. 
that drive the, the Germans back. Uh, they are convinced, as the bell said, I have the formula. Uh, they are convinced that they figured out this, uh, this war. Uh, they put together a huge offensive in 1917, spring of 1917. They launched that offensive with 1.2 million troops, with 50 divisions. They will take 30,000 casualties over a period, actually of about four or five days. Then those uh, casualties will begin to go down. And those casualties, by the way, as a footnote, are about the same as what we take in the Meuse Argonne. We take those in Meuse Argonne over 47 days. We have 1.2 million troops involved. Uh, it's about the same level of effort, but the French here take them in a couple of days. Uh, not, excuse me, in a couple of, uh, couple of weeks. Things slow down at the end of 1917. Pétain comes in. Pétain launches a number of set-piece limited offenses. The most important one of those is the La Maison offensive. This is to be the formula for the future for them, how to attack, how to keep down casualties, how to drive the Germans back. Well, by the way, John J. Pershing was there as an observer that day when they launched that attack. Pershing's comment in his memoirs was, well, this happened about the time of Caporetto, and the Germans were far more successful at Caporetto. It's the Germans that really know how to do this. Maybe, maybe not. And then casualties in 1918, the huge casualties really come from the German, uh, not, they, they start with the German spring offensive, then the second offensive, and the third one is the spike here. That's when the uh, Germans come closest to driving the Americans uh, uh, back. Now, if you compare those French casualties to American casualties, I include this just to show you that the French were still in the war in 1917. The red, uh, are the arms, to, uh, the way my eyes see it, are the French casualties, and the blue are the American casualties. Even in October and November, during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the worst days of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the French are taking more casualties than the Americans. The French are taking more casually than the Americans. I doubt most soldiers in France during that period recognize that. Just place that in perspective, Populations of the country during that period. France has a population of about 39 million. The United States has 103 million. In the war itself, the French will take about 1.4 million casualties. The Americans will take 116,000 casualties. Half of those are from the flu. So the French take more casualties in those first two months than we take in the entire war. They take more casualties in that oh, maybe 10 days of the Nivelle Offensive than what we take in the Meuse-Argonne uh, Offensive. So the French are very, very much in this, uh, uh, this war. If you look at that uh, line again, think of that. Think of that as a learning curve. The French are slowly but surely learning how to fight this war, learning how to fight it with fewer casualties, learning how to fight it without... Uh, it being as costly as it has been. The Americans were not attentive to this. They were not interested in what the French were doing. Uh, they will get reports before we enter the war. They will get reports after we enter the war. Uh, we do not read those carefully. We do not listen to their advice uh, very wisely. Uh, we do not treat them uh, with the respect that they probably deserved given what they had accomplished given how much they had suffered up to this, uh, this point. But the thing that comes out of that Nivelle Offensive in 1917 are the French mutinies. On April the 6th, the United States declares war. They will have a meeting shortly before they launch Nivelle's Offensive where they meet with the French President, the French Premier, the French Minister of Defense, all the senior uh, army commanders, and they say, do we really want to launch this offensive on April the 16th? The Americans are coming, maybe we should wait. And they said, no, we should go. So they go with their offensive and they take about 30,000 killed in the space of about 10 days. Out of that comes the mutinies. Uh, they will convict over about 3,500 soldiers, French soldiers, uh, of offenses associated with that mutiny. Uh, 
They will sentence 554 to death. They will execute about 50. The numbers are still being debated on that. I would say actually about 35 were executed in association with the uh, mutinies themselves. What's interesting about that, Pershing arrived in Paris on June the 13th. He visits uh, Pétain, the commander of French forces, on about the 14th or 15th. Uh, that, when they met that day, the previous week, Pétain had executed 10 soldiers. He had one soldier executed that day. They basically do not talk about mutiny. They basically do not talk about the condition of the, uh, of the, uh, the French army. June 26th, the U.S. Infantry Division marches down the Champs-Élysées with its, we don't have steel pots, we've got cowboy hats on uh, instead. Uh, by then, the executions were over. Uh, the Americans had arrived, but the, the French had been profoundly affected that year in terms of their will to continue this war. You can see that in the conscription figures. Uh, the French will publish the conscriptions, the uh, Ensumi, the ones who refuse to be conscripted, in uh, 1914, it's 1.2%. 1915, it's 2.6%. 1916, it's 1.1%. There are no figures for 1917. You will not find those figures. Uh, and then in 1918, they have 0.9%. Uh, 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 Point is, it's a tough period for the French, uh, French Army. Question is, what did the United States know about this? We knew something, but I don't think we really appreciated what was going on. Uh, Raymond Swing, who's a, uh, a news reporter, this, uh, this information is coming from uh, uh, the best book, as far as I'm concerned, on the French and the Americans uh, uh, coming in, uh, Andre Caspi's book on uh, La Tombe des Americains. Uh, this news reporter sent a, a report to Colonel House that said, France is dangerously close to revolution on 13 June. What's significant about 13 June? That's when Pershing arrived in Paris. France is dangerously close to revolution. Pershing sends Baker, the Secretary of War, a message on the 9th of July that says, several instances of mutiny have occurred among the troops and it became necessary recently to execute some of the ringleaders. Ringleaders. Uh, by that time, by July, the uh, 9th of July, they had probably executed uh, uh, 25 of the 35 who were going to be executed uh, as ringleaders uh, 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 during this. So the United States knew something about this, but I don't think we really understood what was going, uh, uh, going on. But we also knew the French were taking steps to restore discipline, restore morale. Uh, Pétain was the one now in charge of the army. Pétain was the one who was uh, of uh, making the changes, addressing these issues. And these are some of the things that he uh, did. But let me talk about the first one, Red Army of Recalcitrant Soldiers. They had set up a, a legal system whereby a soldier could be tried and convicted and sentenced to death. And then he could appeal, and he could appeal, and he could appeal, all the while staying in his unit. And with the rot, of course, that would be around that, you can imagine the problems that that uh, created. And one of the things that uh, Peytan did was he ended that. He shipped most of those soldiers to North Africa, uh, and uh, they finally found out the outcome of their sentences when they were in North, uh, North Africa. One of the other things he did was to rebuild trust between soldiers and officers. Uh, that was a major uh, concern because he wanted to see officers in the trenches. He didn't want the soldiers to think they were the only ones exposed to this, uh, uh, this danger. Uh, he insisted that soldiers uh, know who their commanders were and that the commanders knew who their soldiers were. They were not just faceless people who were charging out in the trenches and never to be seen uh, uh, again. And then he made personal appeals, according to the French official history, to 90 of uh, France's about 100, 105 uh, divisions. He didn't talk to the whole division, but what he talked to were the officers, selected uh, NCOs, selected soldiers, and he gave them several clear messages. One was, don't throw away the contributions, the sacrifices of those who have preceded you. We are going to prevail. The Americans are coming. 
the Americans are coming. We also have tanks coming. So have confidence we will uh, uh, prevail. And enough of them believed him for more discipline to uh, return to, to the army. And then to, to restore that discipline, part of the mutiny concerned soldiers simple refusal to get out of the trenches and attack. Some would in fact leave the trenches and march on Paris. Some would beat up their officers. About five officers and MPs were beat to death during the uh, mutinies. Uh, uh, but they, mo most of the units simply said, we will not attack. The Germans, in fact, intercepted three transmissions uh, from the French, from units that said, we will not attack, we will not move. And for some reasons, the Germans didn't recognize the seriousness of this. The Germans did not take advantage uh, uh, of this. But they had to restore the confidence. They had to restore the capability. They did it slowly. They took baby steps. And the final step was this French capture of La Malmaison in late October 1917. Uh, uh, this is a set piece battle. It becomes Pétain's model. It not only dominates the remainder of the war for the French, it will dominate their thinking in the interwar period. Uh, it's a careful battle in which you start with the, the infantry here, the artillery here, the, you have huge artillery preparation, you move some of your artillery, you got more infantry uh, moving, you got artillery moving forward, you always operate your infantry under an umbrella provided by uh, uh, artillery. It's slow, it's steady, uh, but it keeps casualties, uh, casualties down. But ultimately, it does restore their confidence and their uh, uh, capability. A very important point, and my final point, what did Pershing and people around him think? This is the memo in the National Archives written by Colonel Fox Connor. Colonel Fox Connor was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower's mentor. Uh, he's probably the brightest of the group of all the people around uh, 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 Eisenhower at different times in World War II, but he wrote a strategic study in November 1917. Uh, his other author is Leroy Eltinge. I don't have as high an estimation of Leroy as I do of Fox Connor, uh, and then Heinzelman uh, uh, too. But they considered the strategic effects of the Russian collapse, which was happening. They were about out of the war. They were considering the strategic effects of Italy being out of the war. The Italians had just gotten their clock cleaned at Caporetta. What was going to be the strategic effect of this? And then, oh, by the way, Switzerland was mulling over coming into the war. And that, you know, opens up the war in a fundamentally different way. Connor looked at these very carefully, and then he wrote, total French collapse not probable. Now, most of you, like me, have written all sorts of staff studies and all sorts of military uh, memorandum. And you, by putting not probable, you know, you're also saying it is possible. It is possible. So a French collapse is possible. And it's possible here in November 1917 when we're leaping, you know, over tall buildings here in the United States just trying to get troops ready, getting equipment ready. And France is really, really, really uh, uh, struggling. And his bottom line was, it's impractical to continue the war in the event of a total French collapse. But a total French collapse was certainly in the cards in the time from April the 6th, April the 16th, up to this particular, uh, uh, particular period. Thank you. Great. Thank you, General Bodie. And we'll turn it over to Thomas Bogart. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Um, and uh, thank you for sacrificing your lunch hour. Uh, I've been there many times myself. I know it is a sacrifice, so we appreciate that and trying to make it worth your while. So I will talk to you about a specific aspect uh, of America's intervention into the First World War. But before we do that, let's take a step back and look at um, the world in 1917, 100 years ago. So this is kind of what it looked like. This is a contemporary map. Um, the um, Great War uh, was entering its third year. Uh, the United States was still neutral in this war, uh, but this neutrality was really unraveling very fast. Uh, there were a number of issues between the United States and Germany. There were uh, trade issues, uh, political issues, um, 
cultural differences. The biggest issue that separated Germany and the United States uh, was the activities of German submarines in the North Atlantic. Uh, North, uh, uh, German submarines had repeatedly uh, attacked American ships uh, or allied ships uh, carrying American passengers um, from 1915 onwards. Uh, the most famous notorious example is the Lusitania you may have heard of. It was sunk in 1915, it was a British ship, uh, but carried uh, American passengers and it was attacked by a German submarine and over 100 Americans died. In early 1917, the United States, the US government, um, decides to um, not to yet declare war in response to unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, but to break off diplomatic relations. Uh, so we're now entering a time period that is not yet war, but it's also not peace anymore. It's kind of like a twilight zone, right? Um, war is widely expected to, to be declared soon, but we're not there yet. And that is the context of uh, my, my paper here, uh, the Zimmerman telegram. So um, Arthur Zimmerman was the German foreign secretary um, in, uh, in World War I. And he and the German Foreign Office um, now anticipate America's entry into the war at, uh, at some point soon. And they're thinking about ways of how Germany could uh, counter the effects of America joining the Allies. And they come up with this plan, which then becomes known as the Zimmerman Telegram. They decide to make an alliance proposal to Mexico. And the German strategic thinking goes something along this, uh, along these lines. They think if America joins the Allies, and if we can convince Mexico to join Germany and attack, and attack the United States, then the United States wouldn't be able to ship troops to Western Europe because they would be needed to defend the American border against Mexico. Uh, so this is a very basic um, 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 thinking there, a little simplistic, but it kind of makes sense from the German point of view, right? Now, the Germans did realize if they wanted to entice Mexico to attack the United States, uh, they have to offer them something in return. I mean, this is almost like a suicide mission, right, for Mexico to attack the United States. And so they put this kind of um, notorious um, provision into this alliance proposal. Um, they, they offer Mexico German support for the reconquest of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona if Mexico joins an alliance um, um, with Germany. The, um, hold on a moment. So this plan is drafted in rapid time, it takes about five days. The Germans try to do this really fast because they want to get this out before America actually does um, um, uh, declare war. Um, but now they face a very practical challenge. Um, they can't communicate this plan directly um, to the United States and to Mexico. Um, because communications at the time of World War I is done by transatlantic submarine cables. Uh, so every nation in Europe had these, these, these large cables that ran across uh, the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and uh, that those were used to send telegrams. The Germans had those too, they had about five or six of them, but the Royal Navy at the beginning of the war uh, retrieves the, these cables and cuts them. Uh, so Germany can communicate directly with its mission in the Western Hemisphere. So if they wanted to get this alliance proposal to Mexico, they have to find an alternate route. Um, and they have to enlist the help of someone else. And guess whose help they enlist? Of all people, they enlist the help of the Americans. Uh, there is still an American embassy. This is uh, late January 1917. There's still an American embassy in Berlin. Uh, it'll close shop in about two weeks from then, but it's still operational at that point. The Germans approached the American embassy and asked them if they could help them to get an important message to the German ambassador in Washington. Uh, of course, the Americans would like to know, well, yes, but what's in this message? Uh, and the Germans respond, well, you know, this is about peace negotiations. It's uh, sort of some general instructions, um, and uh, which, of course, is a blatant lie. Um, but the Americans say, okay, we'll help you, and they had done this before. So the Germans um, then hand this alliance proposal to the uh, American embassy in Berlin. It's encoded, uh, so the Americans couldn't read it, and this was standard procedure. And then you can follow the voyage the journey of the Zimmerman telegram here on the map. So it goes from the American embassy in Berlin to the American mission in Copenhagen. Um, from Copenhagen it goes to the American embassy in London. From there it goes to the State Department here in Washington DC. The State Department gives it to the uh, German embassy here in Washington. The German ambassador decodes it, understands it's not for him, it's for his colleague in Mexico City. It's encoded in a different code and then sent on uh, to Mexico City. The whole process takes about um, two weeks. 
Um, and remember, the irony here is that what is essentially an anti-American alliance proposal travels on American cables to the Western Hemisphere. And this um, will play a role down the line. So what neither the Americans, though, and the Germans knew is that British intelligence ran a very effective code-breaking operation um, in London under a captain, later Admiral Reginald William Hall. Um, Hall had managed a, a way to intercept all incoming and outgoing telegrams to the American Embassy in London. Um, so he was almost reading all instructions to the American Embassy in real time. So this was an operation aimed at American communications. But because this Zimmerman message, this telegram, travels on American lines, the British intercepted sort of as a matter of routine. Um, it falls into their hands um, uh, because they are reading anything that goes into the embassy. And um, Paul can read this message within a day. He can't read the whole thing. It's the, the, the encryption is a little bit too complicated. But he can read enough to understand that this is, of course, a very explosive message. He sees the Germans are offering American territory to the Mexicans. And he also knows um, that if this is given to the Americans, it might, this might very well trigger America's entry into the war. Um, he doesn't give the message to the Americans at this point. And there's a lot of discussion in the literature why this is not happening. And at this point, I usually ask the audience, can you imagine why Hall wouldn't immediately hand this message to the Americans to show them, you know, the evil things the Germans are up to. Anybody? Exactly, exactly. He wants to protect his sources. If he gave this message to the Americans at this point, the Americans might very well ask, well, this is very interesting, but where is this coming from? Now, of course, he could not tell them, well, you know, I'm routinely reading everything that's going into the American embassy, and this is sort of a byproduct of that. That would be embarrassing, and of course, the, Brit the Americans would then make sure that um, um, the British wouldn't be able to read these messages anymore, and this is what Hall wants to protect. So he has, come, he has, he has to come up with an alternative way of giving this, this message to, um, to the Americans and also having a credible explanation of where this was coming from. And uh, being a superb intelligence officer, he does exactly that. Um, Hall knows from this partially decrypted telegram that the final destination is not Washington, but Mexico. Um, he also happens to have a source or a spy in the Mexican telegraph office, and this person is instructed to buy copies of all incoming telegrams from Washington, so all Western Union telegrams. Um, there weren't that many at the time, so this was feasible. And they're hoping that one of these messages will then be the Zimmerman telegram. This is exactly what happens. Um, so they buy a second, they obtain a second copy of the Zimmerman telegram in Mexico. This is being sent back to London. There it is completely decrypted. And now Hall has all the pieces in place uh, that he needs to give this to the Americans. Not only give it to them, but also give them a credible explanation. This is what he does. He gives it to the Americans. He says, partially truthfully, uh, that it was obtained in Mexico. And he doesn't have to talk about his ongoing code-breaking operation in, um, in London. And that brings us um, to the next point. Um, well, then, what was the effect of this telegram in the United States? So Hall gives it to the American embassy. The American um, administration under President Wilson um, uh, deliberates over this, over, over what to do with this telegram uh, for a few days. In the end, they decide to publish it not as an official government communique, um, but to sort of give it to the press. Uh, today, we might call this a leak. It was unofficially given to the Associated Press. And then on March 1st, 1917, uh, this is headline news in um, virtually every single American newspaper. This is from the New York Times, but there are many other examples. Uh, so so what, what, what did the Zimmerman telegram do, do with, with um, um, America's entry into the war? Um, it certainly wasn't Pearl Harbor. Um, America was well on its way to war. I think you can make the case that it accelerated the decision-making process of the Wilson administration towards war. Wilson himself, I think that's clear, he was personally very upset by this, especially that the Germans would use American um, cables to transmit this. And he then takes a number of decisions that pushes the United States into war, perhaps accelerated America's intervention by a couple of weeks. So that is one effect. I think the more interesting question, I think, Professor Keen will talk a little bit more about that, is what did it do to American public opinion? Uh, when you look at the literature, it's often claimed that the Zimmerman telegram was 
you know, the Pearl Harbor of World War One, the 9-11 that sort of rallied Americans um, behind the flag. Um, but when you look at the sources a little more closely, the picture is, um, is more complicated. American society, I think, in early 1917 was still very deeply divided about the wisdom of going to war. Uh, you had on the one hand of the political spectrum uh, interventionists, um, um, such as the New York Times, I mean, that would be a paper that would fall into this category, um, who had argued for some time that going to war uh, was the right thing to do. And when you look at how they, they perceive the Zimmerman telegram, it's clear they see that as another sign of German perfidy and, and uh, a reason to go to war. Now, they'd held this um, opinion before, but the Zimmerman telegram reinforces it. Um, what is more interesting, though, is if you look at the effect of the Zimmerman telegram on um, large segments of the population that held, um, that were non-interventionists. They weren't necessarily pro-Germans. I think they just saw this war as something very far away. And certainly by early 1917, we're not ready yet to go to war. And when you look at um, papers, let's say from the Midwest, from the South, where many of, where this sent sentiment was concentrated, uh, you find a very different kind of reporting on it. Um, it is being reported on, but very briefly, and then very quickly disappears from the press to the, atten to the extent that it's commented on. The emphasis is more, is not so much that Germany is a threat, but sort of the outlandishness of this plot. You, you can't take this seriously. Are you kidding me? Why, why would the Mexicans uh, attack us? When you look at this one cartoon, and there are others, but I thought this captures it kind of well. It's, it's self-explanatory, right? I mean, you have Germany handing um, um, pieces of, of Mexican, uh, American territory to Mexico, and Mexico is then supposed to attack this towering Uncle Sam in the back. Um, I think people who looked at it this at, the, at the time would be struck more by the, by the improbability of this alliance proposal than by the actual threat. So there's a lot more to that, and we can discuss it maybe later. But um, the, the bottom line is that I would, what I would like you to take away is the Zimmerman telegram, if anything, widens these rifts that exist in American society in early 1917. It is not that event that unites Americans and gets them ready to go to war. Um, but if anything, I would argue it's, it's a divisive, um, it becomes a somewhat divisive issue. And that, of course, then brings us to the la last, last point, what then is the significance of the Zimmerman telegram? Um, I gave a similar talk um, a year ago at a small liberal arts college in, uh, in Louisiana. And in the Q&A session, one of the students asked me, well, this is very interesting. So you were arguing that the Zimmerman telegram was not that event that pushed the United States into the war. Why did you write a whole book about that? You know, what, what, then, what then is the significance? And I, I thought it was a very good question. So I, I pondered that for a while. And a year later, here I am. And here are my answers. Maybe the student is still listening somewhere. Um, so of course, you know, I'm an intelligence historian. Uh, for the history of intelligence, this was an absolutely pivotal event. Until World War I, intelligence to the extent that the term was used was really understood as espionage. You have a spy, you have a source with physical access to information, a person steals it and then relays it back to headquarters. The Zimmerman telegram shows that you can obtain um, a, a lot more information, accurate information, timely information by intercepting it mm -hmm. uh, by signals intelligence. And, and people paid attention to this. Someone who was paying very close attention to this is Winston Churchill, uh, Minister of Munitions in World War I and then, of course, Prime Minister in the Second World War, he becomes a major supporter of um, building up uh, British signals intelligence capabilities, and they did play a major role in the, uh, in the course of the Second World War. The other one is um, uh, also uh, regarding intelligence. If you think about this, this is a, an early example of intelligence gathering information, not only for information purposes, but for using it, um, if you like, for political warfare. I mean, think about this for a moment in abstract terms. You have a foreign intelligence service that breaks into an American communication system at the American embassy. It then takes this information, does not only evaluate it, but strategically leaks it in the United States at a specific moment to affect a political outcome. Now, if that's not a modern approach to intelligence, I don't know what is. Um, um, we would perhaps call this covert action today. The Russians call it active measures. Hall understood he was not only a good intelligence officer, but he understood the power of public opinion and uh, you know, how you use that, especially in a country like the United States where the press at that point even played a big role. Um, but finally, let's go back briefly to its effect on, um, on the First World War. Um, now, I had argued that the Zimmerman telegram 
was not that event that um, rallied Americans, uh, turned every American into an, into, into an interventionist. If the Zimmerman telegram doesn't do that, the next question is, well, what was that event that rallied Americans uh, behind the flag between early March and early April 1917 when the United States enters the war? And, and my answer is, and maybe Professor Keen will comment a little bit on that too, is there was none. Um, I would argue that America entered the war, American society entered the war more divided and, and with more contradictions uh, than France, um, Germany, and, and Britain. Um, during the war, these differences are somewhat papered over. There's, there's propaganda, there's censorship. Um, but you do find signs and symptoms of that. For instance, when, um, when the war, when the vote is passed in Congress in early April 1917, you have a fairly high number of legislators who vote against war. Six senators and 50 congressmen. That is a tremendous number, um, especially given that the Senate and, and, and the House was much smaller at that point. Um, and you would be hard pressed to find a similarly high percentage of legislators who vote against war any time in the 20th century. You have to go all the way up to the Iraq War Resolution uh, to find a similarly high uh, level of dissent, and, and we all know that was a controversial um, decision too. Um, it's also true that I think there was a lot of disillusion after the war in the United States um, about the participation in this war, partly because America was not as united going into it. Uh, the U.S. is one of two countries that does not sign the Versailles Peace Treaty. Uh, the United States does not join the League of Nations, even though this was partially an idea of, of uh, President Wilson. And the United States also very quickly retreats into isolationism. And now, I'm not saying the Zimmerman telegram caused all of these things, but when you look at this closely, I think it goes some way to explain, you know, what all these contradictions were and how and why they weren't resolved. And I thought that would be a wonderful lead up to Professor Kinn's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my, uh, my talk is actually thinking a little bit about early decision making in 1917 for creating this new American army that's going to have to fight overseas. And I, and I, I love listening to both of these talks because I think there were important themes in both of them that I'll be able to pick up on. And and in part, it's, it's, I think, quite well known that when the United States enters the First World War, it really has made uh, very limited preparations for fighting in this conflict overseas. And, you know, we can run down some of the things that America lacked, uh, no fully organized divisions, core armies, available active duty and reserve troops that are fewer than 350,000. Um, we had not been stockpiling artillery tanks or airplanes for ourselves. And we make a lot about this point about how unprepared America really was to fight. And I think that in many respects, this builds on Thomas's point is how much controversy there had been in the period of neutrality. And any proposal that had been put forth to um, beef up our military capacity was seen as preparation for war. And in a very difficult political climate, this had been just hard to secure the funds. There had been some limited uh, reforms and some limited improvements, but nothing on the capacity of what you would need. And for many people, this seems crazy when we think about what Bob talked about. And you've had these, these major casualties that the French have been taking and the British have been taking. And, and how much the government is talking about this is, is an interesting question, but the press was certainly talking about it. American reporters, in some ways, are free agents along the Western Front because we're a neutral nation. And you, you see some very interesting moments where it's the British papers are reprinting accounts by American journalists about fighting on the Western Front because Americans are not subject to the same kind of censorship that British journalists are subject to. And so it was, it was, it's really also incorrect to suggest that Americans don't understand um, what's going on over there and the tremendous casualties that are being taken. And so you have this kind of contradiction, contradictory moment where we haven't really prepared ourselves, yet we do, in a sense, understand the, the, the amazing challenges ahead. But do we? And, and this is where I think it's also important to maybe throw in a, a third aspect here about why America enters and is seemingly so, un, so unprepared is that I think we do have to remind ourselves that when the U.S. enters in April, it's not actually clear what entering is going to mean. 
Um, we look backwards now when we make the assumption, of course this meant that we were going to raise an army of 4 million, of course we were going to send 2 million overseas, and of course we were going to fight in, you know, along the Western Front and take off over our own sector. But I don't think that there was any of course about that in, at, in April. And this was also something that had to be decided and it had to be negotiated and it had to be thought about. And so there were certainly people who voted for a war in a very contentious congressional debate who believed that what they were fighting to do was to really continue the ways in which Americans had already been supporting the Allies, which had been primarily through financing the British war effort and through um, you know, providing food and munitions and, and, and basically using our economic capacity to keep the Allied side um, shored up. And, and so this, this decision-making process does occur quickly. It becomes very quickly decided that we will indeed need to send an army overseas, but I don't think that that's by any means something that is firmly understood um, when America declares war. And so now that we do decide, and we do decide relatively quickly to send this, this, this army overseas, there, there becomes a series of decisions that have to be made in 1917 that in many ways will be pivotal. And again, we sort of uh, emphasize the slowness of the American mobilization because we're so underprepared. It is going to take a full year, really, to be able to have any sort of fighting capacity in France. But I would like to um, argue today that we shouldn't just fast forward to the end of the story and to the news or gun um, and to this major moment of combat, but we should really take some time to consider decisions that are made in 1917 that will really prepare the Americans for their, their, their later uh, combat uh, successes or at least combat activities. And probably in thinking about 1917 and thinking about how Pershing and his staff are, are considering putting this force together and what it, they are preparing this force to do, once the decision has been made to raise a mass army and to transport overseas, um, it's very clear that for Pershing and his staff, they, they understand the challenge, and so therefore they see the decisive uh, American impact as coming in 1919. There's no way that they believe that in 1918 the American army will in fact be ready to make a major contribution on the Western Front. They, they feel that just the logistical operation that they want to create alone will cause this army to be delayed in terms of making any sort of decisive contribution. And so I would contend, uh, I think Pershing gets a lot of criticism for all the things that go wrong in American combat operations in the fall of 1918, and there are a lot of things that go wrong. Um, uh, American historians of the First World War and European historians of the war are always going to argue over the significance of casualties. So we always, we always disagree about what, it was a lot of casualties and what's a few casualties. But I would say that there were a lot of American casualties in the fall of 1918, and a lot of them didn't have to happen. So there's a lot of disorganization in the rear, constantly changing leadership, a lot of the key uh, uh, company commanders were back at school. You know, they were still training these guys because, again, they thought it's really 1919 where we're going to really need them to be at full capacity. And all these things, I would argue, are basically symptomatic of an army that had to fight a major battle way sooner than it was expecting to. And so, so in that sense, um, just events took over, and a lot of the carefully laid plans in 1917 were not things that um, the U.S. was actually able to um, able to uh, put in put into place. Right? Now, uh, the decision to uh, send this army overseas, as I as I've indicated, was an historic precedent for the United States, and and so was a decision to raise the majority of this force through conscription. I've written a lot about this, about the the, the fact that we really should appreciate how, in the First World War, the decision to raise an army using conscription from the very beginning was a break from the past. We had used conscription before, but conscription had usually come in mid-conflict when your volunteers had dropped off and you felt that you now needed some kind of stick 
to encourage men to continue to volunteer. And it was going to be a different situation in the First World War. The majority of men, 72% of the, of the army, was going to be conscripted. And men were not going to be allowed to volunteer into the army after December of 1917 because the uh, concept was that you were building a mass bureaucratic organization. You were going to have to put a lot of people in support roles. And so you just needed your manpower to be able to move them at will as you wanted to not have people enlist in regiments and then not be able to actually move them out. So this really is, in many respects, the creation of the modern military establishment. But I do think it was, I was noting uh, um, Bob's figures about uh, uh, people not showing up for the draft. And so what are the numbers in France of people who, who stop complying with military conscription as the war goes on? And, um, and, and in America, it was actually comparatively high. The estimates are about 11% of American men do not comply with selective service regulations. So that's a lot. And especially when you, you're, you're, you're pointing to 2.2 and, and suggesting that 1917, the figure is a question mark. And I wonder if it's as high as that. And so I think that that does also indicate what Thomas was talking about. But this is an unpopular war in many parts of the country. And that draft resistance is not evenly distributed. It is located primarily in the South. Um, and so these are regions that continue to doubt the wisdom of this war, even as America is full on in. And so these aren't things that just, that just go away, right? Okay. So what are some of the key decisions that have to be made in 1917? And really, Pershing has got a lot on his plate. He has to devise a strategic plan to determine how many men he needs. He's not calling for two million men in a vacuum. He has to think first about the kind of way he wants to make a contribution. He has to think about the training they'll receive, where they will fight, uh, who will command them. That's a big issue um, in terms of arguments between the French and the British and the Americans, and even how they would get to France. We didn't really have the shipping space on our own to be able to get both troops, material, and, uh, and food, and all the other things that were needed across on our, on our own. And in this, in, in making all of these decisions, it is interesting to realize just how much power Pershing was given. In some respects, he's considered to be the most autonomous uh, commander of all American wars because he meets once with Wilson, um, and they don't talk about any of these things. They talk about uh, the recent punitive expedition, expedition to Mexico, um, and they talk about some mutual friends they have in France, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> they don't actually talk about really anything seriously, because Wilson's not interested in that. He's like, you're the professional. You handle the details of fighting. It's just the one thing he did want to be sure was that the, there was an independent American army that made a, dis, a, 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 a decisive contribution that he could use to make sure that he had a, a significant say in the peace. So he's very interested in the way the military contribution America made was going to enhance his political desire to influence the peace settlement. Um, and Secretary of War gives him a little bit more, more guidance here, um, really telling him that the identity of a distinctive American army has to be preserved. And in here, Pershing is getting a lot of support from, from his, his chief supervisors that America will not amalgamate its army with the British and French, but it will in, need to be a distinctive, a distinctive force. And Baker later writes that he gave Pershing only two orders, uh, direct orders, one to go to France and the other to come home. And so in this sense, Pershing was going to be his, his own man, and so it's, it makes sense to think about what he decides the AAF is going to do in 19, 1917. And like I've said, he has to first think about where America is going to fight before he can def definitively set out how many men he's going to, to um, need and also what kind of logistical operation he's going to have to secure. And so he and his small staff go to France, as Bob already pointed out, and they begin reading maps. They're touring the front. Uh, they're studying supply routes. I like to really emphasize the fact that they're studying supply routes because, again, they understand that it's not just enough to put some men in the front lines, that if they cannot independently supply them, they do not have an independent army. And we tend to really put a lot of emphasis in thinking about how Pershing wanted to train his fighting soldiers, but not so much about how, even from the very beginning, he understood the importance of supply. And in the end, he settles on taking over the Lorraine sector of, of the front, 
which interestingly is exactly where the French wanted them to be. Um, I, don't, I didn't bring PowerPoint, but if I did, <laughs> or you probably know from the Western Front that you have the British who are up in the north, and then you have the French, and then so Lorraine was going to be up to the south, and the French really liked this because they felt that this would separate the British and the, and the Americans and put the French in the middle and so that they could actually be the people at mo when, when we went into fighting that would influence the Americans the most. And they really wanted to be the, primarily, the primary mentors of, the, of this new American army that was taking shape. And, in, and another uh, positive part about taking over this sector of the front was that it ran American supply lines, uh, rail lines south of Paris, and so it, it avoided a lot of congestion, adding to the congestion um, further, further north. And for Pershing, there were reasons to pick this as well. Uh, many of his staff officers had studied this terrain as part of a pre-war study of the Franco-Prussian War, and so he felt that, in a sense, this is maybe the place where his staff was also the best prepared to um, lead combat operations. And then finally, in Pershing's strategic plan, he believed that this would give Americans a shot at what he felt could be a decisive victory. He was always, like many commanders of the First World War, uh, 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 retained that hope in decisive victory because he focused on key re German railroad lines and iron mines around Metz and the coal mines in the Tsar and, uh, <laughs> and felt that if the Americans could break through and, and sever these, these lines, that this would force Germany out of the war. And so, and so this meant a lot of things because by picking the place where he was going to fight, he now understood the terrain where American combat operations would take place. And this would, in a sense, inform the kind of training that he then put uh, in place in the training camps. He's sort of seeing where he hopes to end up in 1919 and then begins dialing it back to say, all right, I'm not just going to be devising a training regime in a vacuum, but now I have a strategic plan. I can understand where it is that we're going to fight. And there's a lot of stuff that's written at the time which really tries to emphasize the distinctive way that Americans are going to fight from the British and French. And it all gets wrapped up in Pershing's idea of open warfare. This is, this is, his, this is the constant um, theme that he emphasizes, which is the idea of breaking out of the trenches and being able to resume a, a war of maneuver and actually fight out in the, in the open. But in, in conceptualizing that, and it's, it's hard to always get a handle on exactly what he, what he means, it, he is looking at this, um, this valley, the Moselle Valley, where the Americans will, will in fact fight the Meuse Argonne Offensive, and, and looking at that as the terrain that Americans are going to have to fight in. So how can we best prepare them? And if, if you fast forward to the Meuse Argonne Offensive, He's not all that wrong. I mean, this is, in a sense, a moment of reintroduction of a war of movement. And, and many of the precepts of open warfare that men are supposed to be learning in training camps, are, are, they are attempting, at least, to put them into practice in the Muse, in the Muse or Gun Offensive. I mean, the, one of the big problems that's going to occur is that inability to perfect his supply lines because of the, of the, the fighting coming much faster than he actually expected. Right. So, so I wanted to say a little bit here um, uh, then about how, how the, uh, the French, in a sense, do really try to become the primary influence on the formation of the American army. And it was only a few days after the declaration of war that the French sent a military mission to the United States, and they sent uh, Joffre, who was very well known in the United States as the hero of the First Battle of the Marne. And it was really Joffre that urged Pershing right away to send this token force to Paris, to France, to really raise morale and kind of plant the flag and show the French public that the Americans were on their way. And so, as Bob already pointed out, in June we have uh, some components of the First Division arriving in France. There's a very emotional July 4th ceremony at the Marquis de Lafayette's tomb in Picpus Cemetery, and it's that place that uh, Charles, Colonel Charles Stanton uh, declares Lafayette New Voici, uh, which is Lafayette, we are here. Uh, that often gets misattributed to Pershing. But it is this idea that here's America repaying its traditional debt to France for its aid in the, in the Revolutionary War. So there's a kind of natural relationship between the Americans and the French. And this is something very um, intentional the French, French are going to cultivate in 1917 to be the primary training partner, the primary uh, 
military mentor, the, the, the people who are really helping and coordinating and, and, are, and are interested in, in, in coalition uh, uh, combat. Um, and this is a shift, because if we look at the period of neutrality that Thomas was talking about, you were talking about British intelligence, the relationship between the American and British governments, in the earlier period, it really is America and Britain. We're primarily giving our financial aid through Britain. It's primarily British propaganda that's coming into the United States. It's, it's people who are thinking a lot about this historic relationship as English-speaking nations that Britain and, France, Britain and the United States have together. And I think that in 1917, we begin to see the French very systematically trying to cultivate a much stronger, closer relationship with the United States and the British. And if we look in reality in terms of uh, where the majority of American divisions will train, they will train with French divisions. The French will send uh, a large contingent, and Britain does too, but France sends more of instructors to the United States. Um, we know that um, the, uh, the, uh, the French have got uh, interpreters, uh, liaison officers working in American divisions. Most of them are there as, to spy, to send information back to the French about what actually is going on in the American, the American army. <coughs> and so we see that this relationship is very, very uh, strong. And I just like to make this point because while rhetorically Pershing is insisting on I'm developing an independent army, my, my, I, my idea of fighting is different, I'm going to emphasize open warfare, um, you know, he's, he's, he says this in public, but the reality is how much he relies on the French for, for help. And many of the battles that are fought in 1918 are really coalition battles. <coughs> And uh, more Americans fight at moments under French command than they later like to admit. Right? Now, it doesn't mean to say that we have no help from Britain. Obviously, the biggest help that the British give us is the shipping. And that becomes a huge bone of contention at the end of 1917 <clears throat> in terms of uh, Pershing having to be, uh, in a sense, a diplomat in order to get the kind of shipping space that he needs to get his men and his material over to France. But what I think I would like to just uh, say as I, as I kind of wind up here in terms of 1917 is that, um, again, I like this in relationship to where Bob ended. So he showed us this memo which said, okay, here's America looking at the world in November of 1917 and saying, oh my gosh, France might collapse. Uh, this, uh, or what did you say? It's a Prob probable that probable that they won't collapse, um, but but really, where are we? So here's at the end of 1917 a different perspective, which is the commanders of the British and French armies looking at the American army and saying, "Okay, now they're in, and they've been doing some stuff. Where are we?" And so this is an uh, this is a comment from General uh, William Robertson of the uh, to the British War Cabinet. He says, "The raising of new armies is a tremendous task for any country." And although one, one might expect that America, with her two previous experiences and her supposed great business and hustling qualities, would do better than other countries, in fact, she is doing very badly. My general impression is that America's power to help us win the war, that is to help us defeat the Germans in battle, is a very weak reed to lean upon at present and will continue to be so for a very long time to come unless she follows up her words with actions much more practical and energetic than any she has yet taken. So that's the British view of us in 1917, November of 1917. And Pétain is, is not really saying anything that differently, except maybe a little more diplomatically, where he says, the American army, if it wished to retain its autonomy, would be of no use to the Allies in 1918, except perhaps along some quiet section of the front. And so even Pershing admits later on that he was a bit embarrassed by, uh, by the end of 1917 not to have more to show on the ground. Now, we look back and we can, we can laugh at this and say, well, these fears were overly alarmist. And these, these were not, these pessimistic production, uh, pe pessimistic predictions, in fact, are not what came to pass. But it did go to show that, in fact, as many important decisions that America had made in 1917, that in fact lay the groundwork for, for future successes to come, nobody had a crystal ball in November. And many people, therefore, on both sides of the Atlantic could see potential catastrophe looming. Um, the, the, German, the British and French are, of course, responding to the fact 
that Russia is leaving the war, and as Germany begins to move these troops to the Western Front without a strong, capable, uh, well-supplied American presence there, the ability of the British and French to withhold that expected onslaught, they expect it to be catastrophic if America, in a sense, did not step up its game. So I would say that we put a lot of emphasis on April, uh, when we're talking about the American entry into the war, but maybe the sort of crisis moment in the minds of many of the participants was this November, December period where, where the sense that we had the war won was by no means a, certain, a certainty in the, in the imaginations of any of the leading decision makers at the time. All right, so thank you. All right, uh, thanks to you all for great presentations. And we've got a microphone in the center of the room. If anybody's got <laughs> questions to ask, let's... Uh... We'll turn it over to uh, discussion time. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, one, regarding the American Army in World War I, uh, we were talking about the lack of training it had when it got over there, uh, and it's always been a sort of a point of pride how Pershing said, you know, we're going to fight alone. What would you guys think would have happened had he not had that sense if we did integrate the American Army into the British and the French um, would that have made a difference in casualties and ending the war earlier? That's question number one. And then number two, the recent PBS three-part series, which some of you were in, and I'm sure you all watched. If you could go back and add something into it, because I, I thought it was very good, but it lacked a couple of things, I thought, what would you have added to it? I think you want to answer that question, right? What would you have, <laughs> add, what would you have added to it? <laughs> Um, okay, so the, the, the first part of, of the question in, in terms of thinking about the, uh, the training of the American Army and, um, and its independence. The, I think that realistically it was politically impossible <clears throat> for, for Pershing to think about amalgamating forces in the way that the French and British wanted. And sometimes <clears throat> we emphasize that the political aspects of that decision over the um, practic practical parts of that, right? That wouldn't it have been better <clears throat> to just let experienced commanders take these men and, and use them to fight? I think that Pershing had reasons to suspect that the French and British would not use American troops well. That by looking at the way that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, the French and British have been using their own colonial troops, for example, and put them in, in very many difficult situa situations where they'd had high casualty rates. The idea that the French and British had all also taken on very high casualty rates themselves, so what made, could make him think that they actually knew what they were doing and could use Americans well. So if you, if you gave these troops over and you sustained catastrophically high casualty rates without clear signs of victory around the corner, what sort of political problems would you be creating at home when you have high dra le levels of draft evasion, un an uncertainty on the part of many Americans whether or not this is their war to fight, how can you then sustain American commitment to the war into 1919 and 1920, which is really how long they thought it was going to take? So in a sense, it's the, the, the cost benefits of doing this that just seems you know, clearly to the side of, of something not to do. And, and I, would, I would have to say that we, we think a lot of times just about, OK, well, Wilson wants this independent army. He wants to stay at the peace conference like everybody has a crystal ball and understands this is coming in November. And of course, that's not, that's not the case. I think their, their sights are longer out, and that's what prevents them from doing it. But Bob may have something to say. No, I, I, um, I agree with that. I, I think amalgamation is something that the Europeans talked about, but something the Americans would never have done. Uh, politically, it simply was not uh, possible to do. The compromise that Pershing reached was that he sent uh, the uh, black African-American regiments uh, to the French, uh, much to his discredit, but he did that. Uh, I think uh, there would have been a huge outcry from the United States had the French or the British taken a large American unit into a major battle, had huge casualties, uh, and then it would have been impossible for American political leaders to, uh, uh, to explain that. I, I think uh, amalgamation uh, was a no-go from the beginning. I think Pershing knew that. The people around him advised him of that, why he would agree to send the uh, 
uh, what, 368th and 369th? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, that was a, a, a terrible um, mistake that he made. Uh, had he sent uh, other units, it would have been an even graver mistake. I, it was never, if you read the memos that go into Pershing with regard to this question of amalgamation, nobody on his staff has anything good to say about amalgamation uh, in terms of the way the war is going to be fought, in terms of the way the war is going to be won. Uh, there are no supporters for uh, amalgamation. If I may just add one more item. Um, looking at this from the German side, and it's been a while that I did that, but when you look at the German documents, I think it is true that the Germans initially don't have very high opinion of these American troops because they're new, they're making some of the same mistakes that the British and the French made um, early on. Um, but remember, the U.S. Navy had always promised, um, uh, sorry, the German Navy had always promised uh, no American troops would come. Now, of course, that, that wasn't happening. Uh, and, and if I remember it correctly, I mean, this, this, this deadly spring offensive that the Germans uh, launched in, in uh, 1918, uh, deadly for the Germans is partially because they know the Americans are coming and it's only going to get worse. And I think that's the biggest contribution of these American troops. So amalgamation or not, I don't know the practicalities, but I think from the German perspective, just the fact that they were there, uh, that, that was the biggest effect and the Germans knew it would only get worse. Yeah, I think for the French soldiers too, the important thing was that the Americans were there. Uh, they didn't really care initially how well they did because they didn't, did not expect them to do very well. And then when they saw them in action, they couldn't believe how much they ate, uh, how, uh, uh, how much of their, their material they left in the trenches and uh, how undisciplined uh, uh, they were. Uh, but they were glad they were there. They were awfully glad uh, they were there. I just, just to reiterate that, sorry, I see that um, French uh, censorship reports, which are now reading French mail, uh, French soldiers' mail to sort of see what impact the arrival of the Americans is, is having on the morale of the French army. And there are distinct sections in all of those reports, opinions on the Americans. So they're, they're systematically reading French soldiers' letters to see what they're saying and to see if, in fact, this is making French soldiers have more faith in victory, more faith in their own army, more faith in commanders. And so that's it's a great resource for American historians who want to understand the French view of American soldiers, but it also shows how important that was considered as a factor in French, French morale. You can, in fact, track uh, French morale with those letters. They did. And you can track uh, uh, French soldiers' reactions to Americans uh, with, uh, uh, with, with those letters. And, in fact, initially, they were very positive. Over time, they became... Uh, they began to turn down because they realized that these soldiers did not know what they were doing, that they could not maneuver as units, that in fact the presence of the Americans meant that the war was going to last longer and that this longer war might take them uh, as, uh, as casualties. Uh, so they, it really provides you a good, uh, another learning curve uh, about, about the, uh, the war. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting about these letters, and to my mind, uh, the Americans have not touched them is the American Indians that served with the French, the French also censored their letters. And they, they, they uh, take excerpts uh, from, uh, from them, keep some of the letters, uh, this sort of stuff, and those are stored in the service historique there in, uh, uh, in Paris. Uh, I just wanted to, add, or to say that with um, the decision to give Pershing or invest so much authority in Pershing, that essentially made him the policy maker, the decider for the entire U.S. Army. Not, and I just wanted to uh, hear what the panel had to say about the impact of that decision, not just in France, but also in the United States. Well, I think, as you know, the, that one of the things that creates is a huge, um, what do I want to say, power struggle between uh, Pershing, who's in France, and pretty much given the authority to call the shots, and of course, the War Department, who has to implement a lot of the edicts that are coming back from France, and not everybody agrees with everything that he wants to do, and so as he, um, you know, Pershing says, well, I need X number of soldiers, and this comes back, and then this comes to the War Department, which has to somehow now step up uh, enlistments, inductions, um, the um, uh, uh, physical uh, examinations that are being given to draftees, that these, these are 
these are um, requests that the War Department cannot just snap its fingers and automatically fulfill. And of course, as we begin having problems in the United States with transportation, with, with mobilization, and, and there are many, many things that go wrong in terms of the domestic mobilization process as well that slow things down, you know, you start seeing the angry telegrams going back and forth and a lot of questions about should Pershing be the lone person to be deciding how many soldiers are raised, how much, you know, what goes on ships, what gets, you know, what, what is the sort of shipping priorities. And because you have people in the War Department, you know, Peyton March is, is the obvious one, who, who disagree with some of the priorities that he's setting. And so, but at, the, but at the end of the day, it's really Pershing that prevails. Now, whether or not that's how it should be, that's a, that's a kind of different set of questions. Because a lot of times I think Pershing didn't understand how difficult these things were going to be implemented, especially when it came to manpower. There's a lot of issues about manpower. And the number one issue was racial segregation. Um, so that, you know, that created a huge number of problems because it, it literally just meant that by not having the ability to take any man from anywhere and use them any way you needed, you had to, you had separated out by race. So it reduced a huge portion of men that you could utilize. And just that slowed things down in terms of drafting Southern men, for example, I mean, a small example, but it was something that really made it difficult when you're trying to create this army fast. Well, I would add to that. Uh, it made a lot of sense in the beginning to have one conduit through which all this information and in which all these ideas and programs went through because nobody knew what they were doing. They were building an army. Uh, they were building the support structure. They were building the uh, communications. Uh, and if they had had three or four people in charge while they were doing that, it would really have been a screwed up uh, mess. Later, when they create the services of supply, you know, talk about Gerthels, bring Gerthels in, put Harvard over there and all that, they have to make those arrangements so those things will uh, will function and, and will be uh, will be effective, but it wasn't necessary at this beginning when they had a very narrow pipeline and really had no idea what they were doing. Uh, uh, it made a lot more sense to make those changes later when they had a, a better feel for what uh, for what they were doing. I would also say that we should think of that. We should remember how few communications they really had. It's not like today where the president can call and talk to that gate guard uh, out someplace and say, what are you seeing? Uh, what's going on? Uh, it, it is a long, convoluted, difficult, complex uh, process uh, to get that, uh, get that information. And it makes a whole lot more sense to have, uh, you know, just one place for it to go through, at least initially, uh, uh, than, it, uh, than it does today. Well, my God, it would be absolutely impossible to, uh, to. Something about Wilson, too, though, because, I mean, if you think about, even in terms of communication, compared to Lincoln, who obviously ha wanted a much more hands-on role in terms of picking commanders and <clears throat> strategizing and thinking about military priorities. And I think it's kind of astounding that um, Wilson, who invested, you know, American participation war was with literally the capacity to reshape the whole international relations structure, was completely uninterested in the in anything that had to do with how you went went about actually winning this war. I mean, it was just sort of like you do it, <laughs> and then I'll take care of the rest. I mean, it's kind of interesting that we even in his personality that he was willing to delegate like that. Yeah, I, I would say uh, that historians' view of Woodrow Wilson <clears throat> have changed more over the past few decades. Uh, uh, than uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson ever would have conceived uh, possible because there's so many different questions mm -hmm. that are being asked and now you read it and you, and you say, Wilson did what? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I would, I'll be very interested in reading a book, assuming I'm around 20 years from now, in terms of what the assessment of Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, is. The initial prognosis is it's not going to be as good then as it is now, and definitely not as, as good as it was 20 years ago. Amalgamation is one of those things that doesn't happen after the war begins. Universal military training and the preparedness movement is something that doesn't contribute necessarily beyond the, the, the officer camps before the war begins. 
Could you speculate, please, on what impact a successful universal military training preparedness movement might have had on America's entry into the war and initial uh, uh, contributions earlier than they might have uh, without UMT and preparedness? Well, I think that UMT is an interesting proposal because if you look at, in reality, the, the kinds of training that, that these men were receiving and the, the, um, what really the program entailed, it, it seemed like it was more, it would have been more successful in just kind of introducing men to military culture, military values, discipline, a sense of, of you know, what it means to actually drill, to, to, to march in formation, to, to, to live like a soldier. I think that the, the problem with universe, these, the plans that they have at the time, and of course the military believes that after the war, having been unprepared and having gone through this horrendous experience, that the nation will embrace universal military training in 1920 as something that it should do. And of course, there, those expectations are, are not met. I mean, that idea is rejected after the war, just like before the war. And I think that in many respects, it wouldn't have made a difference. I don't think that even, even after we enter the war, it takes Pershing several months to decide where America is going to fight, how it's going to fight, what its strategic goals are going to be. And I think until you know those things, what are you training men to do? There's no, there is no universal training. There isn't even universal training during the war. Uh, when you look at the number of jobs and specializations that have to go into fighting trench warfare, which is an extremely complex thing to do, people need very specific sets of skills and they, they 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 hang on to and i think we probably still do this today basic training as almost an indoctrination into military culture and values because when you then go to the next step of whatever specialized training you're going to be how much of that really made a difference for you and so there's a kind of cultural component to this that i think is more important which, again, having said that, I don't think the practicalities of it would have made much difference. The fact that we're a very diverse nation, one out of every five soldiers, excuse me, 20% um, of the army is foreign born. So even just the, the acculturation part could certainly have been helpful. But I don't know that it, that, that wasn't in itself the answer to the problems that America would face fighting the war. I, I would add a, a quick one on that. The, the post office there and, and the American wherever they handled postage, uh, had to handle 48 languages. Uh, so it was an incredibly diverse uh, organization. But I would agree with Professor King. Uh, I don't know what uh, more preparation would have done. It, would it have made them better bayonet? Uh, whatever you do with a bayonet, I never really figured that out. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think uh, more bayonet training more individual training, even more rifle marksmanship, uh, except for those who arrived late who hadn't done rifle marksmanship, would not make a, a difference. What was missing were the next echelons. You've got captains who have not the foggiest idea how to run a, ca a, a company. And I, I know they know what's in a platoon. Uh, they know uh, three up and one back or whatever it, it might be. But they don't know what they should do under different circumstances. Then you go up to the battalion level, battalion level is even weaker th than at the company level. You get at the regiment level, in some regiments you have captains commanding those regiments. They don't have the foggiest notion what they are, uh, uh, what they are doing. And then to uh, touch the uh, emperor's clothes, the people around Pershing don't really know how to bring these pieces together and make them function. Uh, they can't put the transportation part uh, with the uh, mechanical part, with the artillery part, with the aeronautical part, uh, and with uh, the engineering part. All of those pieces have to come together and have to function together in an effective uh, way. We had done virtually none of that. No matter how much credit we give Leavenworth, the Leavenworth click, uh, those guys, uh, some of them knew how to do it, but they knew how to do it on a map. They didn't know how to do it with troops. They didn't know how to take uh, a division, a corps, and just move it across country from point A to point B uh, to do something. A uh, preparedness movement would not have had any effect over that uh, uh, at all. 
you know, may, can I, may I just add one point? Um, uh, universal military training, of course, that would have been politically completely unrealistic. Wilson was someone who won re-election on the slogan, he kept us out of war. Um, and that was a popular slogan at the time. It's not even clear if his, if his challenger in 1916 wanted to go to war. He was very unclear about it, deliberately so, um, because he knew this was not necessarily a popular stand. So I think it would have been unpopular. I think preparedness, to the extent that preparedness was being done, this was almost like a sob to people like Teddy Roosevelt and the interventionists. It wasn't really done to prepare Americans for war, but just to signal um, um, interventions. Well, you know, we're doing something. Not really clear what we're doing, but we're doing something and be done with it. And I think Wilson really until early 1917, it's very unclear if he really wanted to go to war. Uh, and then, of course, you can have a preparation for it. And then finally, um, I'm not a logistician, but when I look at these these American, you know, the problems the Americans are are facing in 1917-18, it's mostly a problem of logistics, right? How to get these troops over to um, to uh, to France and and training? Yes, but I mean to get them there in the first place. And until they arrive, I mean they had plenty of time to then train them. So I, I agree. I mean I don't think that would have really altered much universal military training before um, America enters the war. Let me add one mm -hmm. point on the uh, uh, on the training. Uh, uh, they knew how to train them uh, to move from point A to point B. They uh, knew how to uh, supply them uh, in, in uh, doing that, but they really didn't agree on how an attack should be made, how it should be coordinated with the artillery. How do you have the artillery do this, the infantry do that? How do you shift your artillery? They did not understand the basics that the British and French had paid a very high price to learn thousands and thousands of lives, uh, and we simply didn't learn what we should have learned from, uh, uh, from them. Those are skills uh, uh, that we should have had, uh, that somehow or another we should have figured out how to develop them before we got there, uh, no matter who it offended, uh, but we did not uh, do that. All right, well, I think we've uh, just about re reached the end of our time, and. Uh... So I'd like to thank our panelists once more. Uh, and uh, as we wrap up, I'll give a shameless plug for our website, history.army.mil, that's got uh, a sizable and growing World War I centennial educational presence. And then on the table outside, uh, we've got a lot of free stuff from CMH. So please take it all away. <laughs>